as I said in uh, rearranging your schedule, uh, I'm going to start instead with the uh, Every Student Succeeds Acts, the ESSA uh, changes that have recently happened at the federal level. We're going to get an update. Um, and I think that uh, Lou uh, Fabrizio, the Director of Data Research and Federal Policy at DPI, is here with us this morning. Um, is that correct? Um, oh, here he is. Great. Uh, and I'm going to let him uh, uh, go ahead and get started um, and give us the background on ESSA. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, Legislative uh, Education Oversight Committee. My name is Lou Fabrizio, and I'm the Director for the Division of Data Research and Federal Policy. And um, go to the overview. In, in my position uh, with the department, uh, well, let me, if, if it's OK with the chair, I'd like to uh, give Dr. Atkinson an opportunity to get up here, and she is on her way. Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about the new ESSA law. Uh, it is, was long overdue, uh, it, but it was signed by the President in 2010, I mean, December 2015. One major difference about this law compared to No Child Left Behind is that it gives tremendous flexibility uh, to the state while maintaining some of the requirements of No Child Left Behind. You may have many questions about this law, and we do too, because the, the uh, U.S. Department of Education has not released its final regulations, and every time that we have a new law, we have to go through the process of getting those new regulations, and then we use that to develop our plan. There is an expectation in that plan that we have one statewide comprehensive plan for accountability to be implemented in the 2017-18 school year. And that's why we will need extensive involvement, dialogue, conversation with the General Assembly to see if we can meet that goal. Also very important to us as we go through this process is to get extensive feedback from our parents, our teachers, our administrators, our citizens, our business community, and our institutions of higher education. So today we want to share with you the major points of ESSA. We want to share with you a tentative guide, uh, timeline that we have, and we welcome your feedback uh, about that information. And we also have in your packet the following materials. You had a list of questions. Those questions are in your packet for your review, and we'll be glad to answer any questions uh, there. Uh, we also have the timeline and the potential stakeholder groups. If there is a group you would like to include, and we have not included those, uh, please let us know, because this, we want to get lots of feedback before the fact rather than after the fact. And then uh, we have in your handout the federal and state comparison of requirements and the, the key decisions that this state must make under ESSA. Uh, leading our effort to uh, get us to a plan are two people, uh, Dr. Lou Fabrizio, who will present to you the, the major provisions of the act, and uh, Donna Brown, who heads our federal program. And uh, after the presentation, we'll be glad to any answer any question you have for which we have an answer. So with that, Dr. Fabrizio, will you go over the um, 
the high points. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Atkinson. The, the bill that the President signed into law in December was 1,059 pages, and I can assure you that I am in no way going to do justice to representing all 1,059 pages, but I will present to you several slides with some highlights. Um, as you've probably heard, probably read, with the passage of this reauthorization of the old e, former ESEA, uh, this new legislation severely curtails the authority of the U.S. Secretary of Education. Uh, you'll probably recall that the uh, former secretary had taken it upon himself to uh, issue waivers to states and uh, that did not sit well with some members of Congress, and so this new law severe, severely curtails the authority of the uh, Secretary of Education. Um, Senator Lamar Alexander was out front in getting this reauthorization, and he was very adamant, and I think the fact that this legislation passed with overwhelming support uh, was in favor of returning a lot of decision-making back over to the states. The ESEA flexibility waivers that I mentioned earlier that the former secretary had allowed states to uh, request and be granted, the new law specifically states that those waivers will be null and void uh, in August of 2016. However, it does indicate that the states will need to continue providing services that uh, were required under the former waivers through this school year and the following uh, school year. One of the big issues of contention with the new law was the uh, amount of testing, and uh, the new law does still retain every student being assessed in reading and math grades three through eight. It does require science in some grades. And as you can expect, with the former No Child Left Behind, one of the things that it shepherded uh, for many states was what was called the disaggregation of test data. And that disaggregation of the test data, whereby I mean reporting results for white students, Asian students, black students, et cetera, was key in highlighting areas where there are students that are not performing as well as we would hope. And so the new legislation does still retain that reporting of that kind of information, but more importantly, you have to have assessment results in order to be able to uh, determine if those differences exist. Uh, Senator Alexander was also way out front in terms of specifically stating that the federal government should have no role in determining uh, how to evaluate teachers in classrooms. So that is another one of the biggest changes that you'll see with this new legislation. It returns that authority of teacher evaluations uh, back to the states. I've already mentioned the disaggregation of the test data. The new law also adds some additional groups of students for which we will now be reporting assessment results, and those include homeless students, students in foster care, and also military-related uh, students or military-related uh, children of families in the military. In terms of the accountability model, the new law not only requires achievement testing, not only requires uh, graduation rates um, at the high school level, but it now adds a new wrinkle in terms of including some types of indicators of school quality and student success. And what you see listed here are just some examples of what those might be. And for some of them, I know that uh, there are many of you in the room, uh, who are familiar with issues like post-secondary readiness and aware of the fact that the General Assembly requires all students in junior year to take the ACT, and that does give us uh, some of that information. So we already 
um, do have some of the parts and pieces that this new legislation envisions states to have. In terms of the timeline, the federal government, the, uh, the Congress in, uh, in particular, learned an important lesson from what went wrong back in 2001 with the initiation of the former No Child Left Behind legislation in that states back in 2002 when the president signed the old NCLB into law, states didn't really have a lot of time to plan to implement the former legislation. And so one of the messages that the Congress heard loud and clear from many of its stakeholders was that with the new legislation, the states really need time to get to think about and plan effectively to put together a plan that's going to work. And so with the new law, and again, the timeline is listed as one of your handouts. I'm not going to go through every one of those steps. But that timeline is contingent upon our receiving at some point, and we're hearing lots of different estimates of when it might be, draft regulations that will have to be issued by the U.S. Department of Education for comment, and then the final regulations. So the timeline that you'll see in your packet doesn't assume that we'll be in a position to be submitting anything to the U.S. Department of Education until possibly as late as December of 2016. It's very likely we could even go into 2017 before we can uh, put our plan together because with all of the stakeholder input that we will be gathering, it's very possible that we end up with a plan that has certain elements in it that when the final regulations are released, we find out that it won't be allowed. Now, the legislation does make a big point of saying to the secretary that any regulations that do get issued should not be adding any new requirements to the states. And again, that was another shot at the former secretary with um, the requirement that teacher evaluations uh, must be tied to uh, student test scores. The legislation is very clear in terms of the stakeholder involvement, so the handout that you'll have lists numerous organizations and associations that we anticipate reaching out to. It also um, indicates the fact that we will be holding several different public input sessions across the state over the next uh, six to eight months. And we will also be planning, uh, and it's on our timeline, different opportunities to hopefully have the chance to come and present to Ed Oversight on where we are and the progress that we are making uh, to date for those presentations. The handout that you will probably find most interesting is the one that looks at the comparison between federal requirements and current state re requirements. And there are six different areas for which we've done the comparisons. One of them is based on academic standards, uh, where uh, we believe the alignment is there between what the feds uh, will be requiring and what we currently do as a state. Under assessments, what you'll see is that one could make the argument that we go above and beyond what is uh, required under the new federal law. And let me just give a real quick example. With the new law, the expectation is that states will have one comprehensive accountability system. Historically, as a state, because of the way the former ESEA was organized, we ended up basically having certain things that we were doing because, quote, the federal government required it, and then we had other things that we were doing because the General Assembly requires it. And so if you look at some of the data that we report out, we're able to say we're doing this because the federal government says we need to, and we're doing this because the General Assembly says we need to. 
With the new law and the expectation that we have one coordinated comprehensive accountability system, we have an opportunity now to think about how do we try to merge these two different types of systems. In North Carolina, we all know we have the school performance grades, the A through F. The new legislation doesn't specifically say that you have to have an A through F system, but it does make references to what is referred to as an index system, or a system that looks at different indicators and then assigns weights to those different indicators and then comes up with some type of an overall uh, statement about how well a school has performed. So the A through F grading system can in fact be used uh, to meet the requirements of the new legislation, but the new legislation also adds some other things that currently are not part of our A through F grading system. For example, right now we have students in our schools that are um, English learners, in the past, we referred to them as limited English proficient students, LEP students, and uh, now the phrase is English learners or ELs. In the new ESSA legislation, it specifically states that one component of that accountability system must be looking at the progress that English learners are making in acquiring English language proficiency. So that's one example. Another example of something that needs to be built into the new accountability system is looking at making sure that at least 95% of students in each of the different subgroups that are tested are in fact being tested. So that's a way of ensuring that when you're reporting the data that you are reporting data on at least 95% of the students that are supposed to be tested. So the new legislation would involve having to work with the General Assembly to come up with, well, how could we add these additional components to something like an A through F uh, grading system? In terms of interventions, this is another area where we do have some differences between what the federal government requires and what the uh, General Assembly requires. In particular, interventions uh, for identifying schools for support. Uh, with the former legislation, we were required to identify priority schools, which were the lowest performing 5% of Title I schools. Title I schools are schools that receive federal uh, uh, assistance. And we also were required to identify focus schools. And focus schools were schools that had significant gaps between subgroups within those schools. Well, 5% of our Title I schools in North Carolina would be approximately 70 schools. So we have that as a minimum number. Now obviously states can go above that. In North Carolina we actually did go above it because the other thing was we had to identify schools and serve them for three years and we had to then check to see if any of them met the exit criteria. And we were not very successful in exiting a lot of schools so now we have approximately 131 I believe um, priority schools under Title I, under ESEA, the former ESEA. So we have that as some barometer of numbers of schools, and then when you add focus schools, you're probably looking at closer to 250 to 300. But as you've probably heard and seen, under the A through F grading system, we've identified 581 schools. So this is another example of we're actually doing much more in terms of identifying schools for assistance than is required under the federal legislation. Again, it's not that the federal legislation restricts states from going above and beyond what the federal government requires, but it's just an indication of where we do have some differences in how we have done things. The other thing that would be different is with the new ESSA legislation, our plan must be designed 
in such a fashion that it gets implemented in the 2017-18 school year. In our plan, we need to identify the actual schools that we will be supporting under the new ESSA, and we have the opportunity to work with those, with that specified group of schools for up to a three-year period. So the federal government basically is saying, you identify schools that you're going to work on and really provide some heavy-duty support for a three-year period, and then you have to set up exit criteria to know whether or not they exit out of that. And at least every three years, we must then identify a new group of schools, could be some of those same schools, but we identify a new group of schools that we will hopefully support intensively for a three-year period. With the way we currently have the A through F system set up, every year we will be identifying new schools. And so that's another example of where the federal government is giving us an opportunity to identify a group, work with them intensively for up to three years, as opposed to every year possibly having uh, different schools listed. Under reporting, I've already talked about the uh, new data elements, homeless, foster, military connected. And under teacher quality, I've already mentioned the fact that it's now an opportunity for us as a state to relook at uh, how, how uh, teacher evaluations are conducted. And the very last uh, slide is just making reference to a, another handout that you have, which is seven pages of more detailed types of decisions that the states will need to be answering uh, as part of the plans that the states put together uh, for submission to the U.S. Department of Education. And that concludes our set of slides. Okay. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Chair, we'll be glad to answer any questions members may have.